Hello, my dear ones, and may God bless all of us. Today, I want us to talk very briefly about asceticism. It will not be a long discussion, and um, perhaps we'll address this again in other videos. There's just one question in particular I want to talk to you about because it relates to some of the topics we've covered in the past. It relates to prayer by night, night vigil, and it relates definitely to fasting. This idea that somehow our um, struggle to somehow control our bodies, to teach our bodies to behave a certain way, denotes an understanding of the body as being evil or bad somehow. And I want to address that. I can, see, I can see where that idea comes from and I can see how it can affect our strength in any sort of ascetical struggle we attempt. But before we do that, I do need to introduce you to some friends of ours at, um, at Kilninian. They are now in the middle of the church because we started work in the vestry room. We are going to replace the windows, replace the door, we are going to repair the floors, we are going to take down the ceiling, we are going to insulate the walls and we are very happy to finally be doing this. It's a work we started over two years ago when we employed an architect and engineers in order to submit a planning application and then a building application to the local council. Well, all of that is done, we are now ready to start the work, so we've placed the ancient tombstones in the middle of the church so we can protect them, so no varnish or paint or anything of that sort can affect them and, um, and we just want to protect them. They are in fact the main reason why we have to have the dehumidifier on all the time in Kilninian. The dehumidifier and the heating is constantly on in the church, even when we are not in the church, because we have to control the humidity, because otherwise the humidity would affect them. So here they are, our beautiful old, old, old friends, and uh, much more beautiful and better looking than myself, although some of them date back to the 1200s. They, they are truly a treasure and we do our best to protect them and to save them for the generations that will come after us. You will see that they are dressed as soldiers and most probably they are in fact tombstones of knights that were buried in the monastic cemetery at Kilninian. But every time I look at these sort of tombstones, every time I see them dressed up as soldiers, there's something in me that makes me wonder whether all of them were in fact really soldiers. Because have you ever taken part into a service of uh, tonsuring a monastic, male or female? And what you notice through the service is that the new monastic, and it doesn't matter again if we are talking about a future monk or a future nun, the new monastic is being fully dressed as a soldier. So a soldier's helmet, or whatever this is called, uh, becomes a monastic helmet. And when it is given to us, it is given with a prayer that names it a soldier's protective helmet. When we have our cassocks on, our dark black vestments, they are in fact the uniform of a soldier and the prayer uh, that is being said when you are given your uniform, your monastic uniform, in fact names it as a soldier's uniform. Even, even our prayer rope, the prayer rope that is given to a new nun or a new monk, is named a soldier's sword. So a monastic male or female, when, when they are tonsured, is being dressed from head to toe in a soldier's uniform. And that's why I do sometimes wonder if all these ancient tombstones, especially the ones that are very close to the first millennium or going into the first millennium, as is the case with some of the tombstones on Mal, on Iona and the Isles around us,
I do wonder if they are indeed the tombstones of soldiers or if they are the tombstones of a particularly loved and respected monastic who is depicted as a soldier, as a spiritual soldier, as he or she uh, was depicted during the tonsha service. And that is something important to keep in mind, even if you know for certain that the tombstone is in fact a tombstone of, um, of a soldier. It's important to keep in mind because it reminds us that all of us, not only monastics, are caught up, are engaged as Christians into a real spiritual battle, into a real spiritual fight. And that's why we are, and there are prayers for Christians, as Christian spiritual soldiers being part of Christ's army into the world. The only difference, which is the world of difference between Christ's army and a real army, is that whereas a real army gains the world and wins the battle by killing the enemy, Christ's battle, Christ's fight is being won by Christ's soldiers putting themselves on a cross in order to save their enemies. And it is in relation to this vocabulary of war, with this imagery of spiritual war, that I want to say one or two words about asceticism today. There is this idea that somehow because we fast and because we do bows and prostrations and we put ourselves through the struggle of uh, nighttime prayer and everything else we do as part of our spiritual fight, there is this idea that the Orthodox perceive our bodies as something evil or something at least negative, if not evil. And um, things couldn't be further from the truth. Yes, there is an element of trying to control your body, of trying to discipline and somehow educate your body, to have the proper responses when your body is faced with temptation, when your body is faced with the opportunity of sin. And um, yes, there are practices, including those we've mentioned, that are intended to keep control over your body and to discipline your body. But if you fail uh, in your process of educating, of disciplining your body, you've failed the opportunity of your body to reach its own potential. It's like trying to educate a child. It is never a pleasant thing for a parent to do, to discipline a child, to educate the child, to teach the child something new, because the child would naturally fight against all of that. But if you fail to instill in your child a sense of responsibility, a sense of um, work ethics, a sense of love and compassion for everyone around him or her, then you've not only failed yourself as a parent, but you've failed your child. The point of educating your child, the point of teaching your child discipline and ethics, work ethics in particular, is not because your child is somehow evil. When you educate your child or you try to discipline your child somehow, always with mercy, always with love and compassion, you're doing that not because you see your child as an evil little thing or uh, a negative creature of sorts, but because you are aware that your child has a potential within himself or within herself and you are helping your child to reach that potential when the time is right. The same thing applies to our bodies. If we fail to control our bodies, if we fail to give our bodies the tools they need in order to fight against the passions which will affect us, then we failed not only ourselves as our full humanity, but also just our bodies, our physicality. You see, particularly in the West, the problem is not that in the East we hate our bodies. The problem is that in the West, 
there is a sense of lack of awareness of how wonderful our bodies are. And we've spoken about this previously on this channel. There are a few videos out there, particularly one, I think it's called Our True Worth, that I strongly encourage you to see. There is such glory accessible to our bodies. There is such honor accessible to our bodies. Christ is treating our bodies with so much care and so much honor. And we've completely, in the West, lost sight of that. The issue is not that in the East we try to discipline our bodies so that our bodies do not fall when temptation comes along. The issue is that in the Western culture we've forgotten how glorified, how honored our bodies are. We've forgotten that these bodies of ours are able to contain within themselves divinity itself. We've forgotten that within this flesh and blood of ours, within the flesh and blood of our brothers and our sisters, since Adam, all the way to the last human being ever to be created, we can contain Christ's body and his blood. We've forgotten that a simple, young, pure girl has become the Theotokos, the mother of God, because in her body, God himself weaved for himself a body. And I think the moment when all of this becomes absolutely obvious is a funeral. If you attend a funeral in the Orthodox tradition, particularly in an Orthodox country, you will see a world of difference between how people respond and interact with the body of the deceased person in the Orthodox funeral and the body of the deceased person in the West. And it is here that you see how much fright the West has concerning our bodies. You'll see that actually, if there is fear, if there is almost disgust, if there is a sense of shying away and wanting to cover, to quickly bury and dispose of a body, it is not in the East, but it is in fact in the West. In the East, we keep the body of the dead person in our homes for three full days. That person is in our home and the coffin is never covered and we interact with the body, we kiss the body, we kiss the hands of the deceased person, we kiss the forehead, we constantly pray over every day and every night there's a continuous row, a queue of people, friends and families and neighbors that will come to pray for that person who will spend the night alone with the dead body of that person. And there is no fear, there is no disgust in praying over that person. I have prayed over the dead bodies of my monastic brothers many times. And I remember being alone at night with the dead person in the coffin. And I remember feeling afraid when I would be away from the body. And that um, for some reason, just being close to them and holding my hand on their hand, I could continue to pray for their salvation in complete peacefulness. You don't see that in the West. You see a rush to, to cover the body and to seal the coffin. And you see a rush to get the coffin out of the house and somewhere impersonal. And if possible, to burn the body away instead of burying the body. So you can continue to have a relationship with the remains of that person. We keep on going in the Orthodox countries for days, for at least 40 days, and we light candles and we say prayers, and the priests come and we pray over the grave of the person. We travel with them, with their bodies. 
we travel with their bodies from life into death, there is no fear, there is no sense of shame because their bodies have died. There is no sense of disgust in relation to their bodies. Because we know that their bodies have received within themselves the sacraments. Their bodies have eaten the body of Christ and have drunk the blood of Christ. And we know that that body is not some sort of um, accessory to the person. The way you accessorize your attire with a hat or a shawl of sorts. The human being, any human being, is made of body as much of as soul. And that is something again forgotten in the West. In the West there's this feeling that somehow we are souls that for a while have to put up with our bodies. But the reality is that our humanity, us human beings, are as much bodily beings as we are spiritual beings. And only this beautiful mix of the two, of the soul and of the body, creates a real human being. There is no shame in having a body. There is no need to treat it with disgust or hatred or to shy away from it. But when I say that, I don't mean the sort of, um, again, Western emancipation of the body where you can walk the street naked and everything and everyone is all right with it. I'm not judging that, but that's actually missing the point because the glory of our bodies does not lie in our nakedness, in seeing this skin. My skin is like your skin. It looks like any other skin. There's nothing personal and unique about our skins. The glory of our bodies, the true emancipation of our bodies, is in allowing our bodies the glory and the honor that God, our Creator, has bestowed upon our bodies. That glory of a chalice which is able to contain within itself God himself. That is the honor of our bodies. That is the glory of our bodies. And when we go through our fasting and when we go through our night vigils and everything we do in our ascetical struggles, we do that because we cleanse our bodies, we prepare our bodies, we discipline our bodies so that they are able to contain God whenever God deigns to come and dwell in us. As he told us that he would. Oh, me and my friends and everybody at the monastery, we pray for you and may God bless you and keep you safe and healthy through this difficult time. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your support and everything you do to make this monastery possible. May we all be blessed. Amen, dear ones. Amen, amen.